What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. You know, I guess this video is going to be an appeal to pastors to please, please fight for your intellectual life. Stay sharp, pastors. And it's difficult to do that because we are constantly working in such a fashion that we are, we're thinkers, we're readers, we're preachers, we're teachers, we're counselors, we're friends, we're leading elders meetings, etc. And if there's any one place where the edge of the axe can kind of begin to get dull, it's uh, it's a danger for pastors. And now I want you to know, though, if you're watching this video and you are not a pastor, uh, please hang with me. I think everything I'm going to say here is going to be directly applicable to you as well. After all, all Christians would want to stay mentally sharp, would want to stay focused, clear thinking, learning new things constantly. I guess that's the real crux of the issue right there is that Christians have to be lifelong learners. I think it was C.S. Lewis in one of my favorite quotes where he said that God is no fonder of intellectual slackers than any other kind of slackers. And he says that Christianity requires no particular education because it is an education in itself. I've always loved that quote from Lewis. And you can notice very quickly if you have a pastor who's axe is growing dull. The blade is just not as sharp as it used to be. And listen, I'm not talking about mental decline with age. That's that's actually not the subject of this video. What I'm talking about is constantly challenging ourselves in the scriptures, in our theological learning, uh, even acquiring new ministry skills as we go. It's extremely important because pastors are so busy that if they're not careful, that that axe gets dulled so quickly just by use, just like any other tool. Um, you run out of ideas, you run out of things to say, uh, complacency begins to set in, you're so busy you don't have any time to prep that Wednesday night message, so what do you do? You just go back to the well and you taught that, you teach that same message that you taught five years ago, and yet you have to remember that you've got some people in your class that were there five years ago. Some people are new, of course, and so that would be fresh material for them, but others that hang with you over the course of a ministry life, man, they're going to hear some of your best illustrations, some of your best stories, some of your best personal personal anecdotes over and over again. And you have to be super careful about that because um, if, if we're not intentional about learning and sharpening that mental axe, then um, uh, our competi- competency begins to slip. We begin to, to be a little bit dry in our presentation, our preaching material. Uh, we get rusty, even though we're constantly in use, yet our skills of learning and reading get, get rusty. And then, of course, the real killer is we begin to be repetitive. And I think this is a very hard temptation for a lot of us who are in ministry to avoid, and especially for those of us who preach and teach all the time. And that is, once you take any one particular topic, let's say it's angels or predestination or justification, you know, you've got your your one or two stories and anecdotes that you always use for that same topic. And so your people know, oh, he's talking about justification. Here comes the uh, the whatever illustration, the Luther illustration again or whatever. And um, our people can begin to kind of anticipate what we're going to say before we even say it. Now, on one hand, that's not bad because that means that they're kind of mastering our best material. On the other hand, if we're entering into the pulpit or the teaching lectern every single week, twice a week, three times a week, and we're not developing any new content, we're not learning anything ourselves, there's the key right there, right? That our people are going to grow very accustomed to and perhaps even bored with our our stuff the more we teach it over and over. So um, let's just think about that sharpening the axe analogy for just a moment. Let's say that you actually were a lumberjack and you're going to go out into the woods, hang with me, and you're going to cut down a tree, right? Well, yeah, get out there and hack away at that tree. And if you have a dull axe, you could probably cut down that tree, you know, eventually. It may take 20,000 strokes for you to finally cut that thing down. But uh, if you were to actually take, let's say, half an hour or an hour before you actually begin chopping that tree to sharpen the blade, of course you're going to be far more efficient in the long run. Somebody sent me an anonymous clip, um, and I promised I would not say who, where, even what region of the country the clip came from. So trust me, you don't know this person. In fact, I don't even know this person. Uh, so it's double anonymous, but um, it was a clip of their pastor talking, and this pastor happened to have what I would consider to be an anti-intellectual view on higher learning, and he was actually ripping on 
so it seemed, um, those who have PhDs. And he made this joke about PhD stands for piled higher and deeper. And then the crowd kind of chuckled a little bit. You could hear it on the video. And then he says, well, what's piled higher and deeper? And he goes, well, the stuff from your previous degree, your BS, which a eh, little crude joke for the pulpit for my taste, a uh, little BS joke. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. And again, he got a little a little chuckle. And so I was thinking to myself as he's kind of, um, it was almost like mocking higher learning there. Maybe mocking is too strong, but certainly pointing fun at those who attain higher degrees and whatnot. Um, I thought, man, I hope, I wonder if anyone is college educated in this church, because if so, they've just been insulted. If anyone's pursuing higher education, if anyone has, you know, kind of an ad ad admiring view on going to get your master's degree or your doctoral degree, they've just been pretty seriously insulted. And um, so I talked to this person who shared this clip and he, and he said to me, well, the irony is this is the third time he's used that joke. <laughs> <laughs> within a few months or a, a couple of years. And so the people actually knew the punchline quite well before he even delivered it. And I thought to myself, you know, that is that is actually an argument against what he's saying because if you wouldn't have to reuse your lame material over and over again if you were continuing to press and to challenge yourself to learn new things. So anyways, in this video, I want to argue for continuing to fight for your life in terms of your learning. And listen, this is not a video about going to college or going to seminary, okay? Though you may think that. I've done other videos about that. People ask me from time to time, should I do that? Usually my answer is yes, not always. Um, but we're setting that aside today, and what I'd really like to focus on for a few minutes with you is how to continually sharpen the axe. Let's suppose that you're already in ministry. Now, of course, I realize that a lot of my viewers are young men. Most of my viewers are young men in their 30s. That's what my uh, my analytics tell me. But a lot of you aren't. You're not in ministry. You'll never be in ministry. And that's okay, too, because I think everything I'm going to say is going to be relevant to those who are pastors, youth pastors, Bible teachers, Sunday school leaders, as well as those who do none of those things. So I'd like to, in this video, give you seven or eight ways that you can continue to sharpen that axe and fight for your mental and intellectual life. As a Christian, we ought to always be learning. I think I could make a case for that pretty strongly from scripture. Well, if you're new to this channel, hello. Uh, my name is Matt Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship, PCA. We are a re reformed, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting church just north of Pittsburgh. If you happen to be in our area or know someone who is, please give us a shout. Come visit us on the Lord's Day. We'd love to have you. I'd love to meet you, shake your hand. We're also planting a church in the Zelenople Harmony uh, Evans City area. So if you just by any chance have some strange connection to anybody in those areas, north of Cranberry, uh, Northern Mars, again, Zeely, Harmony, Evans City, we'd love to connect them with our church planting work. So check us out, Gospel Fellowship PCA. The other thing, I have two other commercials for you real quick. Don't fast forward me. Uh, is that um, first, I'm starting a newsletter and some of you have already signed up for that. I made signing up for the newsletter even easier. Now you can go to just my Twitter uh, or my Instagram and look at my pinned posts there. And there's a real quick form. It'll take you 30 seconds. Just punch in your, your email address and I'll send you my newsletter. It's monthly. I may send it every little bit. Eh, it'll mostly just be monthly. But uh, this month is going to be really important because what's coming up next is our conference. Uh, we are in November 11 and 12 of this year, 2022, hosting again for the second time our Gospel Fellowship PCA conference. This time we're looking at the image of God and we're going to be doing some really cool stuff on human sexuality. That's right, human sexuality. And if you think PCA and sexuality equals the Revoice Conference, forget about it. We know <laughs> this is going to be biblical, confessional, conservative, yes. Um... In some ways, some of the things we're going to be saying might even be construed as a response to the Revoice controversy. We will be taking a very strong biblical and confessional stand on these issues, and we're going to look at some very interesting topics. We're going to be looking at um, homosexuality, transgenderism, pornography, divorce, um, and then preaching Christ in a world of sexual chaos. If I'm ever going to be deplatformed from YouTube, It'll be when we post our biblical, confessional, conservative messages on our Image of God conference here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. I can almost see that coming, getting deplatformed for taking the 
biblical stand on these issues, but somebody needs to do it, and so we're doing it at Gospel Fellowship. The conference is totally free. Uh, we'd love for you to come out to the conference. You do have to register this year. We had kind of a surprising result, people coming in even from out of state last year to our conference, uh, which we did on Puritan theology. And it was a success. I'm expecting us to do fairly well in terms of our attendance. So there is a registration form. You can get it either in the description of this video or in my newsletter, which will be coming out. So you'll want to sign up for that. Or just go to gospelfellowshippca.org and you can sign up for the conference there. It is totally free. And by the way, when you register for the conference, there is a drop down button where you can put in a donation. You do not need to do that. And I'm promising you this, just hit 000 for your donation and you can still register. This is not a money thing for us. Um, we do have to pay a little bit to get the speakers because they're great speakers, but um, you don't have to bear the burden of that. That's our responsibility as a church. So the conference is totally free. All right, well, let's get back to our topic today. And it is how do we keep sharp? How do we stay mentally learning, intellectually engaged? How do we keep that brain and our synapses just popping as we acquire new information, after all, the scriptures are so deep and so rich and so challenging, and there's so many great works of theology from so many great writers in the past. Why would we not avail our things, uh, ourselves to these things to go deeper and deeper into the mind, looking for treasures and gold uh, of an intellectual sort so we can understand the riches of the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Well, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to do that. So let me suggest uh, eight ways that you can continue to learn without going to college or seminary. Now, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying that's a different topic for a different video. Let's say you've already gone to college and seminary, uh, but you still want to acquire knowledge and keep that ax sharp for the sake of ministry and for the sake of your people. What do you do? Well, number one, I'm gonna give you eight. We'll go to a conference. Now, that may sound a little bit self-serving, considering I just promoted our conference, the Image of God Conference, November 11th and 12th. Um, but there are so many great conferences, and I'll tell you, there's, there's something about the atmosphere of a conference that is just electric. Um, if you go to Ligonier, or if you go to Together for the Gospel, or whatever conference is coming up this year, it is just a supercharged atmosphere where you're surrounded by people who love Christ and they're taking away time from their schedule. They're devoting a weekend or a week um, to this kind of higher learning. And when you come, you're typically sitting with people who've got their Bibles on their laps and they've got their notebooks and their pencils and their their wide margin Bibles and their miscellaneous journals, whatever. And, the, and they are taking notes and they are ready to go. And there's just something so transformative about that experience. I have benefited so many times from going to Ligonier, and I haven't been for a while, but I but I have loved sitting under the ministry of the teaching fellows of Ligonier. Um, but if you can't go to one of those conferences, some of them get a little expensive because they tend to meet in places like Orlando where you got to fly in. It's easier to fly into Orlando than practically anywhere else. Um, but, but check out regional conferences as well. You don't need to necessarily go where the big name, top of the bill type speakers are going to be. Um, there are other smaller, more regional conferences, and some of them are absolutely fantastic. So you might want to check out a conference like the Banner of Truth Conference, which may be lesser known, or the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology. Even RPTS, the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh, um, where I have some collegial relations and so, you know some, some good stuff we're doing together there. They have a regional conference. It's not very well, uh, well, it's not one of the major conferences, let's say. It is attended fairly well for what it is. But man, that thing is awesome. And each one of the professors on the faculty, they present uh, usually like a journal article or a paper that they're working on, something that they've been delving into very deeply. And it is, it's just an amazing uh, opportunity. It's not a big super uh, lights and flashy screens like a Ligonier conference would be, but the content and the quality is incredibly awesome. Of course, again, you could come to our conference. But if you can't do a conference, um, how about this? My second idea for staying intellectually sharp. How about a pastor's study group? I'm talking about something more than just a Bible study, although, again, love that too. Sunday school, yes and amen. Um, but what about, a, what about a, a group, and you don't have to be a pastor to do this, but what about a group where you decided to study a particular work of theology together? Now, uh, just a little inside information, a little inside scoop for those of you who aren't pastors, but when pastors tend to get together, and tell me if I'm wrong here, 
One of the things they usually do is play a game of Scar Wars, Scar Wars, and we get together and we talk about how rough it can be in the ministry. We talk about our last session meeting and how it got off the rails, or which deacon is upset, or what's going on in the, <laughs> I don't know, the worship wars or something like that. Uh, we tend to get together and we do sort of like a, a therapy group of, uh, come on, brother, you can you can do this. <laughs> I know that unsigned letter hurt you, but uh, we can, we you know, you got to keep going for the sake of the gospel. We, we tend to get together and do these kind of therapy group things. But what if that wasn't the focus of your pastor's group? Uh, what if you agreed to get together regularly and study some particular great work of theology and just kind of work through it little by little? Um, here in Ascension Presbytery, we've got a little little group of a couple pastors we've been getting together infrequently, but but nevertheless with some regularity to study the book called Puritan Theology by uh, Beakey and Jones. And we've been working through it so slowly and for so long, um, but it's a great study for us. What if you did that? Maybe pick something a little bit more manageable. What if you did like Abraham Kuyper's uh, Stone Lectures on Calvinism? I think there's six of those, six or eight lectures. You just picked one lecture per time, got together and studied that. Or um, if you want something really manageable, like choose some of Jonathan Edwards' letters and have uh, each person read a letter and share what they've gleaned from that. Pick anything. Uh, Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity, A Chapter at a Time, or something like that, or Stephen Charnock, his, some of his sermons, or a sermon from Perkins, or a piece from Owen, I don't know. For goodness sakes, you could study uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress together. That would be an amazing study, but get together, even if it's just quarterly, and study a particular work of theology. I think that would really sharpen the axe, and you'd prep for it because you wouldn't want to disappoint in front of your colleagues and your peers and you would learn a lot for it. And the best thing about it is you'd be doing something that you weren't going to then immediately uh, take to the pulpit. Now, nothing wrong with that too, because again, bring your best stuff. But sometimes learning for the sake of learning is what we really need to do to stay sharp. All right, third idea. Why don't you try auditing a course from a seminary? Now, again, some of you are already seminary graduates and you're saying, well, I already did that. Why would I do that? Well, because there's so much to learn. What about some of the electives that you never took? Um, for me, one of the most exciting things for me, and I know I'm a super geek, is um, if I'm ever at a conference or let's say another church or another seminary, and they have that little book, all of their courses, all of, let's see, do I have one here? Ah, where is that thing? They've got their little course book, and it shows all of the classes, all of the electives that they offer, who's teaching it, what are their certifications and qualifications. Man, there's something about that that just gets me like thrilled to go back to school. But you don't have to pay to go back to school. In, in fact, a lot of times you don't have to pay at all because you can audit courses. Now, um, sometimes it's totally free because you can do it online. Other times you can pay just a mere $100 or so and be an auditor for the course. And you could go either in person or virtually and you could study with a particular subject. Maybe you want to get some basics in philosophy. Maybe you want to uh, go back and sharpen up in some, some New Testament epistles or some Old Testament books from the Pentateuch that you, you didn't really study in depth because... Honestly, there's so much to learn, even if you get an MDiv, which is a monster-sized degree, kind of like getting a JD in, in law, um, there's still a ton of stuff that you probably didn't cover. So go audit some courses. You can probably do it, if not free, at least very cheap. Fourth, there are today so many opportunities to get certificates or non-degree diplomas, again, in a very cost-inexpensive way. Um, let me just name a couple of opportunities. One would be go back and do a non-degree certification in biblical counseling. There is a group called the ACBC, and I'll probably really mess up what the acronym stands for, but it's uh, something biblical counseling. Uh, these would be the guys that do sort of newthetic biblical counseling. You know, you can get various levels of certification to do that, and the basic level I think is pretty attainable. You do some readings, you listen to some lectures online, and if you can, you observe some counseling in progress. I mean, that would be an incredible way to learn a new skill. I'll simply tell you this, and this is uh, being a little bit transparent here, some of the gripes that I have about my education, um, especially at Ashland Theological Seminary, where I probably have more gripes than uh, Malone, my, my uh, bachelor's degree, or RTS, which I greatly appreciated it, uh, my doctoral degree, 
Um, but in a lot of ways, Ashland left a lot of holes in the game. It wasn't a reform seminary, so doctrinally it wasn't that great. Um, but also in terms of counseling, man, I, I did not really get trained very well for what I was eventually going to have to encounter in terms of counseling. So that would be something where I'd want to go back, even if I was just listening to lectures online for free on my uh, you know podcast or something like that. I think that would be well worth it. And not only that, but today there are so many ministries that are devoted to education, free education, that it'd be a shame if we didn't use them. Let me just mention a couple of them here. How about Reformed Forum? And those guys are doing awesome. Reformed Forum is doing great stuff. One of my true and best friends is on the board there. And I can tell you, everything that comes out of Reformed Forum is really solid and very, quite deep, as a matter of fact. You can listen to their podcast, but they also go further than just the podcast. They have been talking recently about Reformed Academy, where they have a whole multi-level course on the theology of Cornelius Van Til, taught by Elaine Tipton. So, man, that would be an incredible way to sharpen the axe and learn something that you could never go into that kind of depth, even if you did do a degree um, from Westminster Seminary or RTS or something like that. Um, you might be introduced to Van Til, but you could never go as deep as some of these courses would. So you could become a master of Van Til's theology. Number five, and I think every pastor should do this at some point in their life, what about a study leave? I think, you know, you get to a certain place in your ministry where you should probably go ahead and ask your elders for a study leave. Now, on one hand, some of us, uh, Presbyterian pastors in particular, we have study leaves built into our, our um you know, our working contract, our our salary and benefits and things like that. I get a study leave every week, whether or every every week, every year, excuse me, not every week. Well, I do get a day off. <laughs> uh, a study leave once a year, whether I use it or not, that's kind of up to me. But um, take a drink of coffee there. You know, if you if you've been in ministry for seven years or ten years, it might be a good idea to approach your elders and ask for a sabbatical leave. Now, if any of my elders happen to be watching this video, I'm not angling in that direction. I've only been here about uh, coming up on three years, so I'm seven years away from asking. Don't worry. But if you've been in ministry for 10 or 15 years, even seven years, um, it might be time to start thinking about a sabbatical leave. If you've been in, I've, I've met pastors that have been in ministry for 20 years, and they still have never had a sabbatical. And I think at that point, you know, it's practically cruel to not give a pastor a sabbatical after that long of time. But probably 10 years would be a good rule of thumb. When I was at Faith Church in Brooksville, they gave me a sabbatical after 10 years. It was 10 weeks after 10 years. It was amazing, amazing time for me personally with my family. We got to travel. I got to do some writing projects, some studying projects. But a study leave might even be as narrow of a window as just a weekend for you to get away. Uh, get a guest preacher in if you're a solo preacher, you're solo pastor and you don't have an associate. Uh, get a, a guest helper in uh, to come preach for you and take a weekend away. And I would challenge you, if you could get a full week from your elders to agree, uh, try during your study leave to write an article or a journal article. Press yourself to go a little bit deeper. Um, maybe do a blog or something like that. That'd be fine too. Um, but if you could do something as rich as a journal article, um, something that you might prepare for publication, that would be an incredible way to force yourself to sharpen that blade. Um, of course, you could outline, sketch out a book project or something like that too. Uh, maybe even if you had a study leave once a year, you could begin the process of writing a book, which is a whole other topic in and of itself. But a study leave is a great way to do some concerted and focused study. Number six, we've already mentioned podcasts and vodcasts a little bit. But um, let me just challenge you, a lot of us have a little bit of a commute to get to the office or at least some downtime during the day. We take our run, we take our walk with a dog, whatever, we listen to podcasts, however you go about consuming that material. Let me just challenge you to make sure that the stuff you're listening to is good. And I don't mean entertaining, but I mean the kind of stuff that'll keep you really, really sharp. I have the tendency, and I'll confess it right now, to listen to the kind of podcasts that get me pulled into the political vortex. Um, for ideological reasons, I'm not a big fan of some of the things that are happening in our government right now. Uh, <laughs> you probably aren't either. Um, and there's something about that des desire to be angry 
which I think is um, that's something we ought to pay attention to in our own character and in our own soul. Um, we don't like it when the other side does that, when our favorite politicians are in power, and sometimes when those that we don't agree with tend to be in power, we tend to like to be furious. And I, I admit that there's something devilishly charming about liking to be angry. Be careful about that, brothers. There's so many other better things that you could be listening to, to the edification of your soul. Let me, I already mentioned Reformed Forum, let me mention another one. If you listen to Apologia Radio, now you don't have to agree with them on baptism or some of their views on the law, um, but they have done some pretty great stuff with uploading a ton of Greg Bonson's materials to the internet. In fact, they've started a thing called Bonson U, where they have all kinds of lectures on apologetics and church history and theology. Again, I don't agree with everything Bonson said, of course, but I have benefited from some of his written works and his debates and some of his talks. I mean, that'd be another thing where you could really, um, you could really keep yourself mentally engaged by challenging yourself in that particular area to listen to good things. Seventh, and I've only got two more, and then we're out. Um, what about a deep dive in a particular theologian? Now, my next video, which I'm going to record if I have time after this, but it's kind of looking dicey, um, is on picking five theologians, one from each era of church history. I think that'd be really awesome. More about that in my next video. But what if you picked one particular theologian and you just did a deep dive into their theology? That would be great. Um, right above my shoulder, you cannot see this, but I've got all the works of B.B. Warfield sitting right there. And I've read portions of them, but at some point, I think I would really enjoy trying to challenge myself to read the whole of uh, Warfield's works. That would be amazing. Of course, I'm already doing that with Edwards working through his stuff. He's got so much stuff that I'll, I don't think I'll ever get through it. But what if you did that? What if you picked one theologian and you tried to read everything they ever wrote? Uh, this morning, I, I just downloaded um, some stuff from the early church. And I'll tell you, I'm going to read everything Polycarp ever wrote, <laughs> extant at least, because there's only one letter. And so I can tell you, uh, maybe maybe tomorrow I can officially say I've read everything Polycarp has ever written, because there's only one letter that he wrote to the Philippians and then a uh, story of his martyrdom. But you could take a theologian that's maybe a little bit more manageable and start working through his stuff, see if you could read everything that person ever wrote. What about Francis Schaeffer? That would be an interesting suggestion. And uh, there's plenty of other suggestions that you can probably think of on your own. Finally, um, I know you're not going to like this, or maybe you will, but you need to challenge yourself to get back into the biblical languages again. Greek and Hebrew, that's right. Some of you who follow me on Instagram or Twitter, you know that for the last, well, it's been almost a year and a half, I've been challenging myself to read through the entire New Testament in Greek. It has been a monumental challenge for me because it's been a long time since I was in the Greek classroom studying the uh, studying the charts and the verb conjugations, but man, I am so blessed and I'm to the point now where, well, Hebrews really was a challenge for me, but James, I'm like actually kind of doing amazing with James. I'm really getting it. And uh, I'm going to move on to the Peter letters and the, the John's letters and Revelation, which I've been told is a pretty manageable book. And my comprehension and Greek reading skills has gone way up, probably the best I've ever been in my whole life. Um, even though it's been years and practically now decades since I originally studied Greek, um, I think I'm probably sharper than I ever have been. And that is really cool to have that, arc, that axe sharpened to the point where um, my knowledge in this area is the best it's been in a while. All right, so those are my eight um, ideas for you. I'd love to hear some of your ideas to stay sharp, stay focused, mentally clear, learning new things constantly, challenging yourself so your people don't get bored with your old, dry, dull content that you've been rehashing and recycling for years. Keep it sharp, pastors. Uh, don't forget you can register for our Image of God conference. It's totally free either in the link that I'm going to put in the description of this video or through um, through my newsletter, which is about to come out, or just go to the gospelfellowshippca.org website and register there. Totally free, but I do love you lots, and we will talk to you later. Bye.